everyone going to play a message here from uh, Julian Assange's attorney, Jen Robinson, in the UK. It's a, a message for to talk about the case and to, to uh, talk about the need for support here. <laughs> Julian Assange sets a dangerous precedent for journalists and editors everywhere. Julian now faces 175 years in prison for publications which revealed evidence of war crimes, torture and human rights abuse. Julian and WikiLeaks have won numerous awards the world over for this important work. The material was published together with more than 100 media partners around the world, including The Guardian, The New York Times, Der Spiegel, Le Monde, El Pais and so many others. For now, Julian is the only person who's facing prosecution for publishing this material. But as we've won since 2010, this is a precedent that can and will be used against editors and journalists everywhere. In this case, the United States government is setting up a precedent whereby any journalist or editor anywhere in the world that publishes truthful information in the public interest about the United States could face extradition and prosecution in the United States. What does this say to other countries like China or Russia? How would we react if Saudi Arabia sought to extradite a British or American journalist to face prosecution in Saudi Arabia for having published information about Saudi Arabia? Already we're seeing Bolsonaro's Brazil using the case theory that the United States is using against Julian Assange to prosecute American journalist Glenn Greenwald. Who will be next? Julian is now in a high security prison here in London where I have to go to visit him. He's asked me to pass on his sincere thanks to all of you and to the supporters that continue to turn up to protests and continue to support the work of the Courage Foundation. Thanks for your work. Welcome. Thank you all for attending this event. It's entitled, The Prosecution of Julian Assange, His Right to Publish and Our Right to Know. This is one of a series of worldwide events in advance of the February 25th extradition hearings. They are being held in London, where the US is seeking to bring Assange to this country to face charges of espionage for revealing US war crimes linked to WikiLeaks by, chased by Chelsea Manning. On sale today is a book entitled In Defense of Julian Assange. And we hope that you will think about purchasing it because what it does is it covers the last eight years of Julian's experience in London. It covers the treatment of Julian Assange. It covers the entire list of publications that he's done. And it, it covers what we face in this country if we don't stop this extradition. So I hope that you can purchase this book and work tirelessly for this event and actually make this book into a weapon to support the cause. Thank you very much. Okay, and on, uh, moderating, moderating our panel today is Anya Perrin Phil. A journalist with, uh, formerly with RT and Telesur, and now with The Grey Zone. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Margie, and to everyone who helped organize this event. Thank you for in inviting me to moderate. And thank you to all of you here spending your Saturday afternoon to reflect on why it's so important for all of us to continue thinking about Julian Assange and organizing in order to resist what would be an absolutely devastating and criminal extradition to the United States. It's never the wrong time to talk about Julian Assange. It's something that we have to talk about and remind people about every day because it's been going on. He's been held for so long that I feel like sometimes people forget. But it's going to be up to us to, to resist his mistreatment and to show that we're going to actually show up in person and stand up for him. I am going to start by introducing John Goodall. 
He is the former general counsel to the New York Times, someone who actually fought for the paper's right to publish the Pentagon Papers. And it's interesting because the New York Times was one of the papers which originally partnered with WikiLeaks to publish some of their initial documents. So please give him a very warm welcome. Well, you might say I'm a vestigial remain of the past, since, as you heard from my introduction, we start back in 1971, when I was the counsel to the New York Times with respect to the Pentagon Papers, but lo and behold, my, my life has come the full circle. And let me explain why. The case against Julian Assange is based on the Espionage Act. It's called 793E. The case against the New York Times was based on the Espionage Act, Section 793E. Both sections apply to each of those two events. The Espionage Act in that section says simply, if you have unauthorized access to information relating to the national defense, you can't communicate it to a person who is not entitled to receive it. I looked at 793E way back in 1971 when a lawyer working for me, uh, meeting my demands for find the law on leaking, brought this back and he said, I can't find anything. All I can find is 793E. And I said, I looked at it and I said, that doesn't apply. That's the stupidest statute I've ever seen in my life. It's vague, and guess what? It covers espionage. The Pentagon Papers aren't espionage, so please go back and find something else. He came back a second time and said, I can't find anything. And therefore, on the basis of that deep, thorough research, I advised the New York Times there was no statute that could prevent it from publishing the Pentagon Papers. And the only law that was applicable was the First Amendment. Our, I was then 22, I was then 37, and my views did not have the same respect as, say, the former Attorney General of the United States whose name was Herbert Brownell, who was the outside counsel for the New York Times, who when asked the same question I asked my young associate, he said, you can't publish the Pentagon Papers, and if you do, you're all going to go to jail. When time came to ask said Herbert Brownell to represent the Times in court, the government had sued the Times for the publication of the Pentagon Papers, which, by the way, were the, just a plain old history of the Vietnam War, one anyone in this room could have written, but stamped secret. He said, I can't do it because I was Eisenhower's Attorney General, and I was responsible for the laws which classified the Pentagon Papers. So there we were, without a counsel, it's not the story I'm supposed to tell here, but it's probably more interesting in a way. And we go into court, and guess what the government asked the court to do? It asked to stop the New York Times from publishing the Pentagon Papers under Section 793E. I told the team of lawyers, which I led at that time, that's just so much nonsense. And as the case went on, the first court that heard this argument said 793E does not apply to the publication of a document such as the Pentagon Papers. In other words, I was right. And so that case, as we all know, probably went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said under the First Amendment, because 793E had disappeared from the case, you can't stop 
a newspaper from publishing. So now how does that relate to Assange? Here's the way I think of it. It's a coin. On one side is the Pentagon Papers case. That's known as civil litigation. The litigation aimed to stop the New York Times. The courts wouldn't let the New York Times stop. Case over. Civil litigation is over. Okay, now we get to the other side of the coin. That's where criminal action can take place. And that's what we have today with Julian Assange. It's the same statute, but it's the other side. And as the introduction stated, the criminal prosecution that is permissible under 793E punishes publication of information allegedly under this Espionage Act, which I don't think applies, because the government thinks such publication with respect to, classif to classified information uh, damages national security. Now, where did that all come from? We, 50 years ago, we had the same case generically, and the court tossed out the Espionage Act. Did the government have this idea 50 years ago that there could be a criminal prosecution like the prosecution we have today against Assange? The answer to that is yes. Immediately after the decision in the Supreme Court case came down, Attorney General Mitchell, do we remember him? Yes, he went to jail in the Watergate scandal. He got so excited he could hardly contain himself and he directed his minions to prosecute the New York Times and to prosecute Neil Sheehan, who was the reporter to whom Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, under 793E for criminal violations of the statute. So Assange case, why it's the first time it's ever come to light, existed in theory 50 years ago. You may ask, what happened? The answer is, Nothing happened. The grand jury convened. It was in Boston because Daniel Ellsberg lived in Boston at the time, and he had made the Pentagon Papers available to Neil Sheehan in Boston. And the grand jury sat for three or four months and never actually subpoenaed uh, Neil Sheehan, but they subpoenaed everyone else who had a leftist view of life in Boston, led by Noam Chomsky, and it looked like they were going to come down with an indictment, and then one day, psh, it disappeared. Well, that was great for the New York Times, wasn't it? And it was great for all of us, because the prosecution under that statute, whether it had taken place, in place then or now, is extraordinarily damaging to all journalism and journalists. The reason being that when a Daniel Ellsberg leaks information and when Julian Assange leaks information, they can be criminally prosecuted for that leak, obtaining the leak, and publishing it. So as the introduction said, what this case is all about is the end in certain respects, if the case is successful, of investigative journalism, of classified and other sensitive information. It's a case I have dreaded for 50 years. It's a case which we must all fight. Thank you. Thank you, John. Not all of us can be lawyers, but we're very grateful and fortunate to have so many excellent legal minds in the movement who can help arm us with the more technical aspects of cases such as Julian's. Especially at a time when everybody, it seems, loves to talk about a war on the press without, uh, under the Trump administration because he calls CNN fake news with ever, without mentioning the fact that the Obama administration actually prosecuted more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act 
than any other presidents combined, all the other presidents combined. What does that tell us? There's a bipartisan feeling here, a fear of revealing the criminal wrongdoing of our government. So on that note, we're gonna hear a message now from Daniel Ellsberg, and he's joined by a special guest, Noam Chomsky, MIT professor. Thanks to a memoir by uh, Jim Goodale, the then counsel of the New York Times during the Pentagon Papers uh, adjudication, the um, attempt to censor the press, actually the first time that there was an effort actually to, at prior restraint, there would have an injunction against the publication. Can we turn up the volume? Anything, mm -hmm. but in this case, Possible. the Pentagon Papers. He revealed that he had known at that time that Nixon, President Nixon, had impaneled a grand jury that was pursuing the prosecution of New York Times journalists like uh, Niels Sheehan and Hedrick Smith. That was very little known up until quite recently. Most people don't know it yet. And apparently their lawyer at that time had uh, told Goodale that he fully expected them to be indicted. That would have been the first indictment of a journalist. Now, almost half a century later, Julian Assange is now the first to have actually been indicted as a journalist uh, on this case. And that will mean essentially that uh, we won't have a free press. The public will know essentially what the government chooses to tell them, however untrue and however selective and misleading about its own operations. It's hard to call that a democratic republic. And uh, that's where we're, we're on the verge of, uh, of achieving right now. The Espionage Act has been an abuse of uh, law continuously since my prosecution. Been used against a number of other people, in particular by President Obama, and now by uh, President Trump as many times uh, as uh, in two years, three years, as Obama in eight years. This new case, would it would be hard even for this Supreme Court, I think, to see it as other than a violation of the uh, First Amendment. And yet, the prosecution itself, even if it fails, is meant to be and probably would be uh, an effective deterrent to uh, investigative reporting in the national security field. So uh, much depends then on preventing or stopping this extradition or prosecution or conviction of Julian Assange. Could you speak to, once again, the, the point about this being a freedom of the press issue? Well, the concept of journalism and publishing has uh, taken a, a more expansive form in the uh, digital age. So there are publishers who don't put out a single hard copy page. They do everything digitally. There are journalists who do their work and post the results. Uh, this, this is a case of a person who is falls within the category of uh, journalism and publisher in the modern sense, and is being not only silenced, but bitterly punished for carrying out uh, what ought to be the function of journalists and publishers in a free society. And in fact, as I said, uh, journalism and scholarship uses his material constantly. So the effort to silence him reminds me uh, of uh, Mussolini's dictatorship. Uh, the great journalist, left activist Antonio Gramsci, who was sentenced to decades in prison under Mussolini's fascist dictatorship. And the prosecutor at the time of the trial said, we have to make sure that his voice is silenced and the way to silence him, but put him in prison. Uh, Assange faces that and possibly even worse. Uh, if the notion of freedom of press means anything, uh, this is a textbook example of a effort to, uh, to undermine it. 
All right, thank you, Professor Chomsky and Mr. Ellsberg. Thank you to the Courage Foundation for collecting those videos. As I said earlier, it's so excellent to see people coming out on this Saturday to think about Assange. And something that is important to keep in mind is that this isn't the only thing that you can do. There are actually things that you can do as people in this country who care about Assange in order to support him in, in more ways than coming to these wonderful events. And our next guest, Renata Avila, is going to speak more about the legal aspects of his case. She's a human rights lawyer. She's on the, uh, the, the team which has helped organize defense of Assange. And she's going to share some of the ways that you can also help with the case. And it always happens to me that you know that I should bring like higher heels when I'm <laughs> I apologize. But I want to, um, I mean, I, we have heard a lot about the case and I, I, will, I have decided that instead of focusing on a lot on the charges, I will focus on the person. I think that I, I am in this very privileged position to share many insights and to tell you more about Julian as a person. And I think that the thing that uh, speaks the best about someone is their work and what they have done and th what they have achieved. And so I will combine some outside facts, some inside uh, stories, and I, I will also uh, share uh, a short video and also will share uh, something very important that is how can you be involved and how can you help. So uh, I will pass very fast the slides because this, this presentation covered far more than 10 minutes. But I want to start by something very, very important, you know. Uh, he's part of this community. Raise your hand if you are an activist. <laughs> Raise your hand if you write opinions that make other people uncomfortable. <laughs> Raise your hand if you care deeply about social justice. So it is not, he is one of us and he should be here, you know. He should be like, we should be organizing to fight the, the big challenges that we have in front of us. And we need him, and we need him here. I mean, we are running out of time. It is very critical to preserve the ability of us to operate in this world. And what is at stake in this case is precisely our community and the ability to say things that upset people and the ability to change things. So many of you, I mean, it has been a long time. It has been a very long time since Wikileaks was created. And I know that many of you like, might remember like the video, the, the video of the helicopter and some details, vague details of the stories that Wikileaks published because since 2010, December 2010, the story moved from the revelations of the corrupt to how terrible person is Julian Assange. And I think that it will only intensify. In the upcoming weeks, we will hear a lot of propaganda about him. So I hope that this presentation is a vaccine against all these terrible stories of, oh my god, he has blood on his hands that you will hear, because those with, uh, with blood on their hands, I mean, uh, like uh, running presidential campaigns. So, um, uh, with that, I will, I will try to be very brief, and, and I am aware of the time, and I want to hear the ideas of others, but uh, this is what Julian is right now, and this is where Chelsea is right now. It is not fair, it is not, it's, it's insane that two of our heroes are uh, in, in this place. Uh, oh, a meeting has ended. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a very quick, I will show it later, but just to dimension the impact of Wikileaks, this is a quick chronology of the revelations of, uh, of Wikileaks. I mean, if you, if you see that uh, by uh, 2000, for, uh, 12, he was already at the embassy. Imagine the, this intense pace of publication that he had. On top of that, he also uh, published a couple of books, did a TV series. I mean, it was a very active, powerful voice that now has been silenced. It has been silenced in a moment that we really need voices like him 
more than ever. And no one is there to replace him. He's very, very, very worried. And why no one is also, no one has been in, in this time very vocal? Because if you look at the people that he upset, I mean, there's practically no, no ally left. Um, trade agreements, the surveillance system, public and private, the most powerful army in the world, uh, US, Syria, uh, the Saudis, I mean, uh, is, is uh, the list of enemies that he has is, is very, very long, but the only ally, uh, and the most important ally, has been always the people. And it is also important to notice that most of the newspapers, most of mainstream media had partnered with uh, WikiLeaks. So uh, it is um, it's a love-hate, it has been a love-hate uh, relationship when so, sometimes, I mean, it, it is uh, as outrageous as you are like collaborating with media, and media that is publishing uh, uh, news about your dirty socks. Expect more of that in the upcoming weeks. So very quickly, because I have just five, I will go, oh, sorry. <laughs> because I want you, I want, you to focus on this person. This is my friend, you know. It has been my friend for like 11 years, almost 12. And he's one of, the, of my best friends. And he's, um, I mean, you will read a lot in media written about how he's an egomaniac, he's unpleasant, he's just, uh, you know, uh, a bad person, he's bad with women, he's bad with cats, he's bad, <laughs> bad, bad. <laughs> and I have to tell you, like, uh, most of the people paid to write those stories have never met him. And that's the question that we have to, to ask. I can tell you because I met him, I mean, I, I spent n number of hours with him, not only as, as his legal advisor, but also as his friend. And he, uh, uh, one of the things that I admire the most about Julian is that he has dedicated his life to public interest. I mean, he could be Mark Zuckerberg. He's probably far smarter than him. He could have make, made a lot of money out of his talent. And he didn't choose that path. He didn't choose a path of uh, uh, data extractivism and <coughs> money and exploitation of people. He put his talents at the service of people, and he did it very early. I mean, I mean, uh, while he was ra raising his son as a single father, a fact that uh, feminists attacking him never mentioned, of course. And I don't, I'm saying that it's extraordinary. It's just something that uh, with, is something very human. Um, and he was busy working in our communities. He was, uh, back in 1994, he was running public access internet. Then he was very active in the free software movement. Then his code was used, probably if you have an Apple device, you have code of Julian written inside your device. And he was doing all of this with the intention to make the lives of people better, but especially he's interested in a specific group of people, in, uh, in a group of people like you. He's specifically interested in enabling courage, in enabling voices, in resisting censorship. And I think that that's, uh, that only by, by that fact you should like him. And you, even if you don't know him, you should really, really, really like, like him and fight uh, for his freedom. And I know that I'm almost over, but what can you do? Do not be afraid to speak up. And I think that it's very, very important to correct at the dinner table to your friends, and especially to your friends in a position of power and in a position of uh, uh, that, that very opinion, opinionated people. Um, immunize yourself against propaganda, please, please, please. Uh, do check like three times the person, the person's writing their, in the upcoming weeks about, about this case and remember uh, the, the contributions of Julian to this community and what is at risk. And this is a political persecution. That's why I'm not discussing, I mean, the, the charges are 18 and are terrible and are stupid and are weak. But this is revenge. This is not justice. So uh, that said, um, I want and I hope that um, we can play this. I really hope it works, the sound.
So it's very important to remember that justice doesn't just happen. Justice is forced by people coming together and uh, exercising strength, unity and intelligence. Um. So yeah, I want to uh, leave it with that. Justice does not just happen. Justice will be forced in this case and we will get him free and we will get him keynote here at this university and we will get him celebrated and back to his children and back to his family and back to his work because we need him here and we are going to do it. Uh, I will be around here, come to me, I can, I can explain you how to help and I, I want to thank you with all my heart for all the love that you are putting into this uh, uh, struggle. Uh, it will be long, uh, I think that uh, I, I leave you with a raw timeline. We might not know the, the end of this case until uh, uh, the summer of 2021. So we need to survive the elections and we need to survive, uh, you know, like a, a lot of, uh, we need him alive and we need him well. And having you here, I will grant to him, I will tell the lawyers who will see him very soon, uh, and I will tell how a crowded room looks like in New York. Thank you so much again. Um, <laughs>
is probably too disorganized to <laughs> appear to the Tuesday schedule. But all that means is that somebody else, some underling, is drawing up the kill list for him. When I was a young man, half a century ago, the Black Panther Party was at the top of the empire's kill list. In 1969, when the FBI and the Chicago police assassinated Fred Hampton and Mark Clark and many other members of the party, the CIA was busy assassinating tens of thousands of Vietnamese village leaders under the Phoenix program. The US empire assassinates whole governments, whether they're popularly elected or not, from Iran to Guatemala to Chile to Congo to Libya to the attempted assassination of the lawful governments of Syria and Venezuela that is ongoing today. The U.S. has implanted more than 800 military bases around the world as a kind of global military occupation, a kind of army of occupation everywhere on the planet. And it has transformed the militaries of much of Africa into extensions of the U.S. military. It has transformed them into enemies of their own people. The United States meddles in the internal affairs of every nation on earth, and it spies on everybody who has a phone. It claims the singular, exceptional right to do so. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, the organization that he founded, were put at the top of the empire's hit list. Assange became the empire's public enemy number one. Julian Assange is, of course, not a U.S. citizen. He's an Australian. But none of that matters because the United States asserts its own global rights and privileges over and above all others. It has universal jurisdiction in its own mind, and it backs it up with the tools of empire. Assange is therefore a traitor to empire and must be destroyed. The empire does not distinguish between internal and external threats because it considers the whole world as its imperial jurisdiction. And WikiLeaks was disrupting imperial rule. Americans are familiar with Chelsea Manning's release to WikiLeaks of that video and that audio of the US helicopter troops and their massacre of Iraqi men, women, and children, and journalists, and medical workers in Baghdad. Those images demolished the image of US troops as liberators, and instead showing them behaving no differently than Nazi armies in Europe during World War II. Now that, of course, was no secret to the Iraqis. The helicopter <laughs> massacre was carried out in the bright light of day in Baghdad, and it was not that different than other, many, many other atrocities in Iraq. The Iraqis were no stranger to U.S. atrocities, but for U.S. audiences, these images were devastating. They utterly demolished the advertised picture of the U.S. military as a force for good in the world. It is images like these that turned the U.S. public against the war and made it impossible for the U.S. to again deploy its huge land army in the Middle East. That became politically impossible. That is why President Obama was compelled to arm and finance vast armies of Islamic jihadists, Al-Qaeda in fact, as ground troops of empire in Libya and in Syria. That is just one of the reasons that the U.S. empire will never forgive WikiLeaks, will never forgive Julian Assange, and will never forgive Chelsea Manning. They have contributed mightily to the weakening, the material weakening of U.S. imperialism's global war machine by making it partially unusable, by forcing the U.S. to openly ally itself with Al-Qaeda, an alliance that the whole world knows about, 
except for the U.S. public. <laughs> WikiLeaks right. and others have totally discredited the U.S. imperial project. WikiLeaks became such a threat to U.S. empire that the CIA and the rest of the U.S. imperial security apparatus treated it as a hostile foreign power. Now we know that WikiLeaks is not a state power, it's just an organization. So the U.S. had to claim that WikiLeaks is an agent or an ally of an actual foreign power, that being Russia. It is from this that Russiagate was born. It is because of the massive disruption that WikiLeaks wrought on U.S. empire that publications like Black Agenda Report have been blacklisted and called dupes and agents of Russia. That's why Google has rigged its own algorithms, those wonders of science, to do exactly the opposite of what they are supposed to do and to point people in exactly the opposite direction from which they are searching. <laughs> WikiLeaks has done a great deal to tear the narrative of American exceptionalism to shreds. That's why Julian Assange is a political prisoner in Belmarsh. That's why he is among our most honored heroes of the real resistance, because the real resistance is the resistance to U.S. imperialism. Power to the people. So key that you brought up the issue of empire, because that really is what we know. Julian Assange's only crime was to expose the evil and the wrongdoing of empire. And actually someone who wasn't a journalist when these, when, when WikiLeaks first came to be and we learned about the, the State Department cables, I remember, and you probably remember too, that, what was that? You were very young. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that uh, Tunisia set off the Arab Spring and at the time, even mainstream corporate media outlets were dubbing it the first WikiLeaks revolution because for years, for 23 years, Ben Ali had ruled in Tunisia and the people knew that his family were benefiting and doing dirty deals behind the scenes and had this special relationship with the United States. It was an open secret, but once WikiLeaks actually published cables showing the U.S. State Department referring to his family as the family, as though they were a mafia controlling Tunisia and showing that his wife was profiting off of building schools and, and, and issues, issues like that in Tunisia, it actually armed the people with the information they needed to change their government. And that's part of why I said, wow, I want to be a journalist. If, if doing something like publishing information can have that effect, then I think it's, uh, it's why a lot of us do what we do. And, and Glenn, we're also at the gray zone, one of those blacklisted uh, Russian propaganda outlets, so solidarity. <laughs> Speaking of the gray zone, Max Blumenthal, our editor and founder, is our next speaker. Max and I work together at the gray zone, and always, whenever we're working on reporting about Latin America or all over the world, still turn to WikiLeaks documents to this day, constantly find relevant information and are so grateful and indebted to the work of Julian Assange. So I'm sure Max will be speaking more about that. Is this thing on? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Anya, thank you to the Courage Foundation for uh, having the, the courage to let me talk. I don't know how it's going to go over. Thank you to my computer for dying and killing my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Problem. Did it really die? Yes. We have a video to play if you need a minute. What the heck? We have a video to play if you need a minute. I blame the CIA and the Mossad. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually really troubling. Is the battery actually dead? Do, no, do, do we have a video that we want to play, Nathan? Sorry, we actually... Okay. 
We're alive. Oh, 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 oh. We are actually going to a Alice Walker. She's joining us via phone. All right, well. So you're safe for a moment. She's on the line. 2014, me and Alice Walker were on the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Foundation's list of top global anti-Semites, and she was ahead of me on that list for showing solidarity with Palestine, so I gotta give her the floor now. Unfortunately, she could not join us via video, but we're very fortunate to have her words. You think live from Mexico. Uh, Alice Walker, can you hear us? I can hear you very well. Okay, people are excited to hear you. Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> well, it would be very nice if you would give me a little bit of context and perhaps pose a question. Sure, so we've been talking about Julian Assange the person and Julian Assange the prisoner and uh, the indictment that he faces and, and what that might mean for journalists and other practitioners uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, and so can you just talk about uh, the prosecution of Julian Assange and and what that means in a, in a kind of a wider context. What are the implications for the rest of us? Well, I went to see Julian in his um, captivity some years ago, uh, and I was there because <clears throat> it seemed absolutely cruel and unbearable that such a, a strong and staunch and honorable person should be uh, in prison just because he was trying to help us understand that some of our countries, especially the United States, are trying to destroy what's left of many people's lives around the globe. Um, I've always been very much impressed with his courage, uh, with his you know, generosity, actually with his own life force. This is someone who has given up so many of the pleasures that we enjoy who are not incarcerated. Uh, time with his children, with his family, with his father. So I, I very much feel that. Uh, and I felt that when I saw him in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy in London, uh, he's also quite prickly, which I, I was, um, I, I really took, a, it took a while for me to understand um, that that is just his character, that, that he is so specific about things being factual uh, that he, he actually he was a little irritating in that regard, uh, but I think what that what I finally took from that was that this is someone who really wants the absolute facts. He wants the truth, um, and that made me feel even better eventually um, about him as a person who has really fine character. Whatever else people may think or you know dream up or posit. This is a man of character, and he doesn't seem to lose it just because you've come 2,000 miles to his cell to talk to him. So I think that that's a good thing. Uh, I think that we should continue to try with all our might, all our might to get him out of any incarceration, uh, to reconnect him with his father and with his children. I think it's a deep crime, you know, to, to keep him from his children. Um, and that's about what I, I feel. I mean, if you have another question uh, to pose, I would be happy to, to attempt to respond. Yeah, so we have a, a room full of uh, activists and supporters of Assange and WikiLeaks. And so what can we do uh, to raise our voices to, to make an impact here? Uh, well, I think for each person, there is a way. And that is where we are now. We are not actually in the time anymore of just thinking that some group that we put together is going to do it. This is a time when each person has to really decide whether they feel that they deserve a life on this planet in freedom and joy and, you know, possibility of some dancing, uh, or whether they just are going to be, you know, happy to have other people do the work. And so, so wherever you can make a difference, wherever you can speak, wherever you can walk, wherever you can, can send letters, whatever you can do, I mean, just do that, you know? and encourage that in everyone uh, on every issue. I mean, it's not, I mean, Julian's, um, Julian Assange's issue is, is, is incredibly vital and, and crucial to our freedom of speech. But there are all these other places where people really will just have to get up and stand up, uh, in the words of Bob Marley, you know, and, and be there for whatever they truly believe in, or we have no future. 
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you, Nathan and Alice. On the note of what you can do, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Big Apple Big Apple Coffee Party. You guys probably all know Bernadette and Chuck up front, but every week, every week they have a vigil out front of the New York Times educating people who walk by about Julian Assange. 430. Grand Central now? Yeah, Grand Central. Grand Central Station, 4.30. To 5.30 every Thursday. Every Thursday, so. Main concourse of Grand Central. They were doing it at the New York Times. Did they give you a problem? <laughs> well, it's very important work to be out there speaking with people about Assange, so that's something anybody here in New York can do. I think now we're ready to go to Max if his computer is functional this time around. I feel like that computer jinxed me, so. Um, thank you again, everybody, for coming out on Saturday afternoon. I probably wouldn't have. I'd probably still be asleep or something. Um, and thank you to the jury. Thank you to the jury that just refused to go along with a federal judge in a DC court to convict the Embassy Protection Board. And now we have a mistrial for these four people who stood up against the phony coup and white-collar mafia of Juan Guaido and the imperial forces behind him and said, no pasaran. So thank you to the jury. I'd love to say thank you to the jury. It's some big journalism award ceremony for all the great work we're doing at the Grey Zone, but that ain't never gonna happen. I know how it is, and that's actually kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about WikiLeaks, but I also want to talk about who's not talking about WikiLeaks, who's not talking about Julian Assange, uh, and why they're not talking about him. Well, one reason they're not talking about him is years of public demonization. He's been branded as an anti-woman rapist, a lunatic colluding with a psychologically dysphoric transnational security criminal, a far-right libertarian, a far-left anarchist, an anti-democratic Russian asset wrecking the otherwise perfectly democratic Democratic Party. <laughs> and a hacker, in the words of the inappropriately named Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno, who was accused of spreading feces on the walls of the besieged embassy that served as his home and de facto prison for so many years. And after all this, now that he's in Belmarsh Prison and Maximum Security Complex with high-level criminals, Julian Assange is finally being ignored by the mainstream media and public officials. Well, this isn't thanks to any Bob Dylan-esque wish to return to anonymity after years in the spotlight. And unlike Dylan, Assange has been determined to communicate to the international public with a clear, decidedly ungarbled message demanding transparency. And today the message is a survival, is a message about survival, not just of Julian Assange, but of critical, skeptical, courageous adversarial journalism itself. And it is a message that we have to carry to our officials against his extradition. I wanna talk about another reason for this silence. It is partly thanks to malice against Assange, true, but it's also due to a political ecosystem of press freedom NGOs, investigative and supposedly open source journalistic consortiums, human rights groups, and quote unquote civil society activists funded by US regime tied billionaires and corporate multinationals, which function exclusively in the interests of American empire, but which operate behind the language of solidarity, rights, and justice co-opted from the global left, this network silent about Julian. In 1991, Washington Post reporter David Ignatius, no wild-eyed anti-imperialist, 
described the birth of a new post-Cold War apparatus that operated through NGOs, like the National Endowment for Democracy, and private billionaires to do what the US intelligence services used to do covertly, but this time in the public, as cutouts this ecosystem of billionaire-backed imperial NGOs and the opposition movements they supported has been exposed in glaring fashion through Cablegate, the Stratfor leaks, and many other publications that appeared on the uniquely securitized platform of WikiLeaks. And today this ecosystem that I'm describing, this imperial ecosystem, they want you to know about authoritarianism in Russia, authoritarianism in China, Nicaragua, in Venezuela, wherever whoever is targeted for regime change, but not in the West, where we're defending the rules-based post-Cold War international order by sending border patrol tactical teams into sanctuary cities, building the wall and sanctioning the huddled masses on the other side into oblivion when we're not removing their governments through coups innocuously described as color revolutions. They want you to know about millions and millions of Uyghurs in concentration camps in China, the blood of hundreds of journalists spattered all over the designer shirt of the richest man in the world, Vladimir Putin, and the babies dying in chigger-infested Venezuelan incubators while Nicolas Maduro samples delectable slabs of steak sliced by Salt Bay. But with a few notable exceptions, they don't want you to hear about Julian Assange. This ecosystem draws its resources from the endlessly growing fortunes of Silicon Valley, Valley billionaires regarded by many as altruistic liberals. I'll name a few now. Craig Newmark, the Craigslist founder, who almost single-handedly destroyed alternative print media by depriving it of its main source of revenue in classified advertising. So by the early 2000s, if you wanted to pro procure a used George Foreman grill or a massage with release, you went to Craigslist, not the Village Voice or its print counterparts could pick up for free in any newspaper box. Now Newmark is building up a new media after tearing down the old one. He has his name on a journalism school down the street, I think at the new school. He's funding an assortment of media fact-checking organizations like Pointer. Uh, he's funding press freedom outfits like the Committee to Protect Journalists, which I'll talk about in detail. The Alliance for Securing Democracy, an ironically named Russiagate media censorship outfit that recently falsely smeared the gray zone as a state-backed media account. I'm gonna take 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. All right, we're on a strict schedule. I'll make it, I'll make it, I'll make it. He's also funding Mother Jones in the name of waging an information war against Russia with a million dollars to Mother Jones who rolls in her grave. Newmark is joined by eBay founder Pierre Omidyar who funds many of the same organizations in an eye-popping array of new media outfits that have become repositories for mysteriously obtained leaks and supposedly open source journalism that provides fuel to the engine of regime change. One of them is the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists, which recently published the China leaks to support the case for sanctions based on the notion that Beijing is imprisoning millions of Uyghurs based on their ethnicity in concentration camps. Can't go into detail with the time I have about that. Um, but Omidyar is best known as the founder of The Intercept, an adversarial branded media organization that owned the Snowden NSA files. While still the home of one of the most courageous journalists in the West, Glenn Greenwald, whose indictment read like a carbon copy of Julian's, five years since its foundation, The Intercept has abandoned and buried the Snowden NSA files and has become a repository for Syria regime change propaganda and published the oddly timed Iran leaks, spun as an expose of Iran's evil doing in Iraq just days before the US assassination of Qasem Soleimani. In 2019, Omidyar showed his hand when he provided seed money to Iraq war neocon Bill Crystal's The Bulwark, which recently described supporters of Bernie Sanders in no uncertain terms as Nazi brown shirts. Chief among the billionaires, David Ignatius named in his original 1991 report, was someone whose name I'm afraid to mention for fear of being labeled an anti-Semite and a crazy conspiracy theorist. Well, there's conspiracy theories and there are conspiracy facts, and this person is George Soros. Am I gonna disappear? 
who's become a prolific funder of media organizations through his open society institutes, democratic politicians, Obama, Hillary on down, and super PACs like Pacronym, a part of the acronym Dark Money Operation that spun out the Shadow Incorporated app that wrecked the Iowa caucuses. By mistake. <laughs> I'm saying by mistake, you can laugh. Come on, you don't believe me? What? <laughs> Most importantly, he sponsors an array of opposition parties and NGOs in countries targeted by the US, which were exposed in Cablegate. These billionaires have joined with the National Endowment for Democracy, the US government's chief arm for sponsoring regime change, to establish an organization that I see as an answer or a counterpoint to the threat of WikiLeaks and a response to the crisis of trust that the US intelligence services experienced after the Iraq War. It's called Bellingcat. It's a collection of supposedly open source digital detectives led by noted video game expert Elliot Higgins, who has labeled Assange Noel Edmonds with Botox and a dye job and said that Ecuador, through its partnership with the CIA cutout UC Global to surveil Assange, was merely spying on Julian Assange's wanking schedule. Some real solidarity there. Whenever Russia, Syria, or another global do evildoer accused of some chemical crime, this outfit produces open source findings that immediately demonstrate their guilt in places like Duma, Syria, where the Syrian government was accused of a chemical attack that justified US missile strikes on the country. They're then given awards by the press freedom organizations funded by the billionaires and NATO-aligned governments that comprise the imperial ecosystem. I just described it is all so much more credible seeming than sourcing information to unnamed US intelligence officials or to defectors with code names like Curveball. Thanks to WikiLeaks, we learned that not everyone at the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, was comfortable with the organization's findings on Duma that according to two whistleblowers, the entire incident in April 2018 was staged by US and UK backed opposition groups and the Saudi backed extremist armed opposition to make the case for war we were lied to again. The Committee to Protect Journalists is the major press freedom organization at the heart of this imperial NGO ecosystem. It is funded by the aforementioned billionaires and corporations and in the past, it has ad advocated for Julian Assange. But at this year's CPJ Gala Award Ceremony, I'm almost done, its executives explicitly refused to name Assange as an imprisoned or persecuted journalist. Instead, see the CPJ honored Lucy Pineda and Miguel Mora, directors of the Cien Pier, Cien Noticias tabloid station in Nicaragua and US backed leaders of the violent coup that aimed to remove the leftist elected Sandinista government in 2018. And before Pineda and Mora were awarded on stage, they were taken to a personal meeting with Vice President Mike Pence, the face of the government that is seeking to extradite Assange. I should tell you that I interviewed Mora in July 2018 after the coup, and he told me that he favored a Panama-style solution in which the US government, the US military, would invade Nicaragua and take out its leadership. So these are the people that are being honored by press freedom organizations that are ignoring Assange. There could be no better illustration of the betrayal of solidarity and the imperialization of the NGO sector than this repellent display that I just described. When we look at the lay of the civil society landscape in the West, we see a bleak field of co-opted outfits, but we also see, and I see right now, a mass of people, especially young people, who are increasingly skeptical of the official story, who are disenchanted with the status quo, disgusted with the corporate media, and who are mobilizing to establish new networks of organic solidarity and alternative publishing platforms like the Black Agenda Report, Consortium News, Mint Press, and The Gray Zone, which seek to embody the spirit of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And we also must look at the Courage Foundation as a perfect example of this new organic network of solidarity. This movement is cohering behind Bernie Sanders and his presidential campaign, and this movement must apply pressure on Sanders, as it did on the issue of Palestine, to guarantee his opposition to Julian's extradition. That is a mission for everyone in this room.
and it's a mission for everyone in this room to call out Pete Buttigieg, who said that he was uncomfortable about Obama giving clemency to Chelsea Manning. That is unacceptable and undemocratic. And while we fight for Julian and against his opposition, we must not forget about Joshua Hammond, who gave us the Stratfor leaks, and who's Jeremy Hammond. I'm gonna, exp well, I'll get to why I me messed up that name. Um, who gave us the Stratfor leaks and whose prison sentence has been unjustly extended, and Joshua Schult, the CIA whistleblower, who gave us the Vault 7 leaks, which provide the basis for Julian's indictment. I want to leave you, I'm being told to stop, I want to leave you with a quote by an OPCW official who is not one of the whistleblowers. Uh, we received an email, Aaron Mate at the Gray Zone received an email from uh, this official that was leaked to us, uh, and this official explained why they could not speak out about the lie and deception that took place in Duma. I fear those behind the crimes that have been perpetrated in the name of humanity and democracy, the official confided. They will not hesitate to do harm to me and my family. They've done worse many times, even in the UK. Even in the UK, he's referring to a prior record. I don't want to expose myself and my family to their violence and revenge. I don't want to live in fear of crossing the street. This was a fear that Julian Assange did not share, and it's why he is in Belmarsh, and why the US is seeking to extradite him. That's why. So don't be afraid. We must not be afraid. We can't share that fear. We have to speak out. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we can hear some of the other information during the Q&A session and from all guests. Uh, we'll have a chance to open it up to the floor for you guys to ask questions, make comments that are on your mind. But first, we have another video that we'd like to share from, once again, Noam Chomsky, professor at MIT. This is a special interview. Did you conduct this interview, Nathan? Uh, we, somebody in LA did, but we... We the Courage that. Foundation produced this interview, and Chomsky made it specially for this event, so without any further ado. What is your hope for Julian Assange? Hope. My hope is that the British government has the integrity to release him from prison and put aside any further requests for extradition. My second hope is that the population of the United States will understand what's happening, rise up, and prevent the administration from calling for extradition. We're looking at a political prosecution. This is plainly a political prosecution. Uh, he, as I said, he's not being charged by the Trump administration with releasing information that harmed Hillary Clinton. In fact, they openly cheered that. So he's not being charged with that. He's being charged with releasing information that the government doesn't want the population to see. Is that a political... How do you have a clearer criterion of what's a political crime on a, at a rather trivial level, in fact, when you see what's involved? But putting all that aside, it just doesn't matter. If the extradition treaty said uh, to the British government, do whatever you're told by the White House, it would still be improper. It's independent of the technical legalities of the extradition treaty. Moving forward, if Julian Assange's demise here, either either physical or political, or being, him being imprisoned at some point again for the rest of his life, what does that tell us for the future in this era of of Trump and malfeasance and... It tells us what it would have told us if Dan Ellsberg's trial had gone through to completion. Remember, he was on trial for probably a life sentence, and the trial happened to be stopped by, a, by a, another Nixon crime. Uh, what happened was that Nixon tried to bribe the judge, and the judge therefore called a mistrial. Otherwise, Ellsberg would probably be in jail. And what would that tell us? It tells us we live in a 
very repressive society with an authoritarian streak in which the government has the power to prevent the population from knowing things that the government doesn't like, uh, this would be the same. Just a quick message that you would want to communicate to interested parties uh, who are analyzing this case. The main thing is that the technicalities really don't matter. I mean, the basic issue is clear and simple. Here is somebody who undertook to release to the general public information that the public should know. Uh, and he is be, has already been harshly, very harshly punished for that. He is now at this moment being punished in the conditions of the high security system. He's being threatened with much worse. The message to the public is this should not be tolerated. It should be ended at once, independent of any technicalities of law that some lawyer might pick up. for arranging that interview, sharing it with us. And again, to our guests, Glenn Ford, Renata Avila, Jim Goodell, who I want to apologize earlier for repeatedly referring to as John, and commend you for being too kind to correct me. <laughs> I've just read it and then I went with it. <laughs> I apologize. And Max Blumenthal. Now, if any of you guys have questions, we would like to open up the floor. We're gonna have a mic right there so people can line up. And a personal pet peeve of mine during these events is when the moderator doesn't cut guests off, so I'm definitely, or questions off, so I'm definitely gonna be a stickler when it comes to questions and comments and ask that you leave them between 30 and 45 seconds. Uh, but if you wanna make a comment, feel free. I'm sure guests can pick it up and, and, and play off of it. Or if you wanna ask a more direct question, Feel free, so we can get started. Good afternoon. Thanks for everybody for showing up today. It's good to see people like Glenn Ford and Max Blumenthal in the flesh. My question's for Renata. Um, could you please tell us in some specificity what's going to happen at the extradition hearing and what are the possible outcomes of that day or uh, or and possibilities for the uh, case to be, you know, extended, kicked down the road, and this not be a like a, a make or break situation. I think we'll go ahead and like allow the guests, the the speaker, to answer the question as opposed to collecting a number of ones. If that's okay with everybody, just to keep it yeah. kind of a conversation. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, it is around the corner, the beginning of the of this, and it is it. The shape of this trial will be known at the end of the first week of the hearings. And I can read you quickly a uh, time. I mean, what will happen is like a lot of media attention at the very beginning. And then it, it will be a very intense process because it is scheduled one week in February and then from the 18th of May to the 5th of June. So it's very, very intense for the lawyers, for the family, for the team. But I don't think that it will be like uh, as intense the reporting, and that, that that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. So um, important dates um, on Monday and uh, Monday 24 and Tuesday. Uh, what will be discussed is um, first the argument. Monday is the crucial day because Monday is the day where the U.S. will say why are they prosecuting Julian and the evidence that they want to use against him. So that's the day, I mean, if you if you design a timeline for the activists, that's the day when you have to be super upset saying that this is absurd and that this is political and that this is an, uh, a threat to all journalists. The second day is the day that you say, like, you are completely right, because it's the day that the defense will present the, uh, the arguments. Um, it is very technical, so uh, but it, it is very simple, as Chomsky was saying, is 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 publishing. So I think that part of the task that we need to to do here is to simplify the technicalities 
and to make people understand, like, no, oh, article 9.C.B, point point no, that's not working. I think that, that that day is very important to, and you will help us uh, transforming those arguments into things that people can understand. Uh, and then the other days it will be discussed the treaty, whether the treaty uh, is valid to extradite someone to the US or not. And the last day of the hearings is a boring but crucial day because then it will be defined the next schedule and the rules of the game. And in the rules of the game, I think there is important, an important fight is that uh, the defense wants to reject anonymous witnesses. And, and, and the government wants to present anonymous witnesses. You know, and, and that that's will be a very crucial point of the conversation. What can you do? I think that, uh, I mean, I, I have been a lawyer 15 years and I, with lots of high profile cases. I think that this is a marathon and we do not need to run it as a sprint. I think that it's uh, very good to have a key issue is not to get the attention fade away and keep the intensity, like keep a healthy intensity on the actions that we do. I think that it will be very important to hammer the arguments of the government uh, from February to uh, May, because we will have then the general public prepared and and a broader uh, group of the population prepared to reject it when uh, the, the crucial moment comes. And sorry to extend it so much, but I think that it's important to understand the timeline. Uh, what happens then? It is a minor court. It's not the high the high court. So it's highly likely that they will say um, he he should be extradited because they will not like. I mean, they, it's, they probably will not like the responsibility to. Uh, deny extradition at that level. So it's highly probable, I mean, there's chances that he will be like, if a miracle happens and reason prevails, that he's uh, um, um, not extradited, that he's denied, but still there's an appeal. I think that it will, de it will, uh, it will be really good for him to be under house arrest, but it's highly unlikely. So uh, what happens next is to wait for the verdict of the court, and then highly likely appeal the verdict of the court, and then it will be like a higher court, and that's the big fight. And once that happens, next summer, that it will depend on the. You know, like it, it's sad because in the case of Julian, things that need to happen uh, to take long are quick, and things that need to happen quickly take forever because of technicalities. So it is uh, they. If you read the the arbitrary detention. Uh, decision by the UN, you will see it, it drives you crazy. If something we, uh, needs to, if something has discretionary uh, time, it will take one year. If something has a fixed uh, date, it will be delayed and delayed and delayed because, in the case of Sweden, for example, the, the prosecutor was on vacation, so it, it will be like, and we need to watch that. And I think that another group or another group of students can, for example, monitor similar cases and how this is treated differently. It's very important information to prove uh, that it's political. And that, that said, highly likely, like the end, if it goes like this on the minimum time, will be summer 2021 with the appeal. Without the appeal, will be summer this year. It, just one last quick uh, clarification on the I timeline. It, it, I know, but if, if he is found innocent uh, in May, will he be released on appeal or will he stay in jail? Uh, highly likely will stay uh, in jail. I mean, uh, because of a risk of um, going away. Um, right. But then diplomacy plays a role and we need to pressure Australia. We really need to pressure Australia to negotiate there. That that will be the window of negotiations, uh, diplomatic negotiations, not political negotiations. But that's the other pressure point that we haven't uh, like exercised quite strongly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would respectfully request uh, the chair, Anya, and others. Uh, this is a comment. It's a very friendly comment, but I need more than 30 seconds. 
And if I'm going to be cut off, I won't be able to say anything. You've got to keep it to 45. Well, Just because there's a lot of... I know there are many people who have something to say. Well, how about I'm, this? How about we make sure that everybody can ask their question, and then if we have time at the end, I'm... Well, then, if. That's the big if. No, I, I would like to at least speak until you cut me off. Sure. At least. Well, well, My name is Fred Mazellas. I'm speaking on behalf of the World Socialist website and the Socialist Equality Party, which, as everyone here, I think, knows, have been in the forefront of the struggle to defend both Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. And uh, I agree with very much of what has been said today. I think that the uh, comparisons with the Pentagon Papers case are very apt. We have also have to ask ourselves why this is happening, why the case that Jim Goodale says he's dreaded these decades past has come to pass now. And I agree, and that was your 45 seconds, and I'm happy to let you finish again later after everybody else gets a chance. That's just the way that I think that it, it gets it gets a little drawn out if, if people are allowed to just take over the mic. So we're happy to hear from you later, but let's, let's move on to the next question, please. All right, I want to thank the Courage Foundation for hosting this event and for hosting many events um, throughout this country to bring awareness to Julian Assange. And I also want to take this moment quickly just to... Um, call upon the corporate media, more members of the corporate media, to show support for Julian Assange. We are seeing more people uh, come out and show support, and that's so important, and I look forward to seeing more of that in the coming weeks. But quickly, I know the latest interpretation of the First Amendment in the UK and the Constitution was that the First Amendment does not apply to foreign nationals. However, the Espionage Act of 1917 does. I know that um, Julian Assange's US attorney, Barry Pollock, has said that he does not agree with that assessment. Can you explain in a further depth um, perhaps what could be done to maybe reverse that interpretation? John. Jim, Jim, Jim. Call me with a full, with a full mouth. Uh, the, the question is essentially, whether the government's assertion, which they're going to make right at the beginning of the case in England, that the First Amendment uh, doesn't apply, uh, has any merit. Uh, the short answer is no. The government's position uh, depends on a Fourth Amendment case, which is not a First Amendment case. The government's position depends on something happening outside our borders. Julian Assange, once he went on the internet, went all over the world, including this part of, of the world. Number three, the only decision I know on this case particularly was decided by my former partner, who is a First Amendment partner, who decided that Julian uh, Assange in the DNC case, which concerned the leaks, had First Amendment rights. So I say he's got First Amendment rights. Thank you, Jim. And if people are interested in hearing more from Jim and Renata, I would just like to point out that they both contributed essays to the book in defense of Julian Assange, which is for sale here in the back. Hold it up. I've got the book at home, Max and I. We've got to actually have it on my bookshelf on my show, so I recommend everybody check out that book. Let's continue with the questions. Yes, I'd, I'd like to ask a, per, um, a question. Uh, personal question about uh, Julian Assange. I was very concerned about his mental state. Uh, there were reports of uh, psych the psychological effect that this is having on him, his disorientation, uh, so forth, after his arrest. And I was very concerned about that, and I'm wondering if uh, um, he is aware of the support that he has from people like us throughout the world, and if this is having a positive effect on his uh, mental state. Hello, he's indeed aware of the support, very, very thankful. And it's not only, you know, like when the, uh, in the cases I have worked, it's not only him, it's the family as well. I think that uh, he and his family, especially his father, are very grateful and aware of the, of the support. He didn't receive letters because you can write to him actually, uh, to the prison, and he didn't receive letters for a long time because he was in the medical guard, but now he is no, no longer in isolation. He's with the other prisoners, and he's, he is the, uh, the single person receiving the most mail of the entire Belmarsh prison. And 
And uh, it is tricky, I mean, and you have to be like, if, if you want to, your message to reach him, I mean, be, uh, read the rules, because there are lots of rules, and uh, the, the issue of books is a big issue, because he cannot keep uh, the same amount of books at once, and he, he uh, keep receiving like the books uh, that uh, on the order that they are received in the prison. And he, uh, one of the comments to using his humor, you know, that he still keeps is, please do not send him books of people who have spent like long periods of time in prison. <laughs> That's not relaxing <laughs> or reassuring. Uh, but yeah, encouragement, ideas, Opinions of what's going on outside. I mean, he was he has very limited time for the internet, and he uh, uh, is using all that time for his case. So things that you think that it might interest him, comments about what's going on in politics, in technology, that kind of things. I think they will be very welcome uh, to 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 alleviate a little bit the, the situation that he's into. There is literature in the back on the left by the book table that will tell you exactly how to write to Julian. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Peace. My name is Shahid Kamrade and I'm a Secretary General of Pakistan USA Freedom Forum. I wish I mistake as to the name of the moderator. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Goodell that how you feel the future of the freedom of speech in this world when the so-called European superpowers and the BBC owners, British people, and our country, United States, when you see the activists, what's the message? But I want to say my Valentine love to the Julian Assange, my solidarity with the Guantanamo Bay, Pakistan USA Freedom Forum solidarity with Afia Sadiqi and anybody who's a politically present inside that, anywhere in the world. Like a 30,000, 8 million people in Kashmiri at this moment and a lot of uh, minorities in India. I'm going to ask you how you feel about yes. it. Thanks yes, so much. Thank you for all being here. I feel optimistic generally about freedom of speech generally in the world because I think that the internet generally enhances such speech. I am pessimistic with respect to the control of speech about government. And that, in a sense, is what the Assange case is really about. The case is about the speech that Assange made concerning U.S. government activities. The government doesn't want this speech out, so it classifies it. The recent case against uh, Greenwald is a further example of what's going on worldwide where the government of Brazil is trying to control the speech that Greenwald has made about the authoritarian government in power. So if you think about the situation worldwide, which I believe was the question, with respect to governments controlling their information, I think as information expands because of the internet age, the government is going to get more and more control of it. So you won't know what the government is doing. And that's why the Assange case is important because if Assange loses, that means the government has a green light to use its power to our detriment. Thank you, Jim. I just want to ask if anyone has a question for Glenn Ford or Max, but especially Glenn, it's been a minute since we've heard from him, if you want to step forward, uh, just to mix it up, make sure that we're hearing from all, all guests and... Anyone? Anyone? Or my friend at the mic, if you would care to. Yeah, my question is simple. First, I want to thank everyone and thank everyone for being here for Julian Assange. And is there or why isn't there a lawsuit against the U.S. government and its war crimes and its, um, I mean, I can't even think of a word strong enough to describe its overreach of, um, you know, I mean, why are we not suing or doing, you know, the Hague, the International Criminal Court? And that's... I don't know if anybody wants to take a stab at that one. 
Venezuela is just. I was I was going to mention that. Yeah. Want. Well, Ven Venezuela's foreign minister was actually at the Hague this week to present its case against the United States, saying that unilateral course of measure, measures sanctions are actually illegal under international law and are leading to the deaths of thousands of people in Venezuela. That's an issue that we've covered very closely at the Gray Zone, uh, but I don't know what other avenues think, people have. I think, that the, I think that the answer is in the WikiLeaks cables. It is incredible. There have been lots of attempts and lots of very courageous uh, activist lawyers uh, trying to push forward uh, not only the International Criminal Court, but uh, bring back universal jurisdiction in different countries. But it is like there's lawfare, you know, like it's a lawfare operation against those who attempt at that. And there's also, uh, I mean, lots of pressure, inside pressure. You can le read a lot on the cables. One of the lawyers of Julian Baltasar Garzón was victim of that. When he wanted to go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, prosecute under universal jurisdiction, uh, the people on, uh, involved in this country uh, on the Iraq war, I mean, it was an avalanche and, and, uh, against him. He was, his, uh, his, uh, he was, uh, disbarred, basically. So, yeah, in, in brief, we need to, not because they're saying no, we should stop trying, and yeah, we, we need to continue exercising that muscle of uh, uh, lawsuits, but it is not looking like very promissory now, but it might change. Can I just say really quickly that I know going through the, you know, um, ch you know the normal uh, chain of events or whatever to take, you know, we have to do it outside the yeah. box. Yeah, I think that's what everybody's trying to put in mind. Margie, did you want to yeah. speak? I, I just want to say that in the, in the U.S. courts, we have tried over and over again to raise issues of, to raise issue of the drone strikes, to raise issues of torture, to raise all kinds of international issues. But it is impossible because the response we get is that is a national security question and you may not raise this in this courtroom. That's why the work of WikiLeaks and the work of uh, leakers and hackers all over the world is so important because they give this information to the people. We can no longer use this information in the courts and we depend on the people to bring this information out. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, Niels Meltzer, the Special Rapporteur on um, Torture of the UN, uh, has said that uh, Julian is being tortured and has been tortured for years now. And uh, along with what the last questioner asked, that there obviously is no legal way to challenge that because the U.S. apparently tortures with impunity and uses its, uh, it, you know, its client states like the U.K. to do so as well. But what I wanted to ask anybody on the panel, uh, per, uh, particularly Renita, is that um, you know we read a lot about uh, as much as we can hear about Julian Assange from people that visit him and so on, but we have never or rarely I've never seen any direct statements from Julian Assange. People coming out saying, you know, this this is this is what Julian Assange wants his all his followers or all his supporters to know, word for word, because one of the first things he said to Nils Meltzer was that my voice has been taken away and it's still taken away and we don't hear from him directly so if anybody can answer that very quickly I think I mean I don't know why he's not making statements directly but I guess that is uh, a lot has to do with decision of lawyers because it's a very complicated uh, moment uh, before the arguments are made I think that that's the case and I will check and confirm if that's the case um, yeah, but he has contact with people at least now, um, and I don't know, uh, that's, the, that's the answer, but I, I guess that uh, it is a personal decision, and it's a decision of the lawyers as well. Given the uh, Patriot Act and the NDAA and the repeal of the uh, Bill of Rights, let's hope this never happens, but if uh, Julian Assange is extradited, to the United States, it would seem that it would be a uh, uh, de facto conviction. Do, does the panel see any variables such as a Bernie Sanders win or any other events that could potentially uh, protect him if, if such an event occurs as you know as a U.S. trial? Thank you. Would Glenn or Max like to take a stab at that? Glenn? I, I, I alluded to that or. 
spoke directly in my um, rant about the uh, imperative of applying pressure to Bernie Sanders in public forums about Assange to make this to make to make it known that this is an issue that the movement that's propelling him forward really cares about. And I think he has listened. Um, I remember in 2014 when Israel was waging its Operation Protective Edge assault on the uh, besieged Gaza Strip, which ultimately killed 551 women and children. Bernie Sanders shouted down a town hall in Vermont, shouted at his constituents who were protesting his position effectively in support of the war. He would, a uh, group in New York City um, at a, a forum on climate change in 2016 during the campaign protested Bernie Sanders with a giant banner and it's, you know, holding him, holding him accountable for that position. And while Bernie Sanders' public position now on Palestine is not anywhere close to where I would want it to be, it is miles ahead of other politicians in the field and that's due to pressure that's been put on him. So you have in Bernie Sanders someone who at least has to listen, at least for now, to his grassroots base, and that stands in stark contrast to figures like Pete Buttigieg, who really um, takes advice in wine caves. Um, so let's use every 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 mechanism at our disposal with whatever's left of the democratic process. Yeah. Let's, uh, Can I say something on that? Let's have, uh, I want to give Glenn, because he, he did have a, he did reach for the mic when I asked. No. Can you hear me? No. 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 Is mine working? You have to hear me. Turn it on. No. Yeah, it is all well and good and necessary uh, that appeals be made to various luminaries and potential presidents, but there is no substitute uh, for a movement showing its own power uh, at agreed upon points of actual people pressure. Uh, and it will be, and that is absolutely necessary. Uh, more important than the luminaries and how they feel about different things. Uh, but it's, it is also important as a test of what kind of movement uh, we have. What is the real resistance and what is the phony resistance? And I think the humanitarian interventionist streak that has uh, revealed itself uh, and revealed that our movement is smaller than we thought it was uh, will probably uh, show itself in regard to any uh, attempt in support of Julian Assange on the ground as well, uh, but we need we need to uh, we need to be clear about what our strength is, and you only become clear when you try to flex. Speaking of movements, every Thursday at four thirty at Grand Central Station is a vigil for Julian and Chelsea. Please join us. And I want to give you the opportunity to uh, respond to that question since you said. No. I just want to remind everybody that Obama was persuaded by a group of which I think I was part not to bring the case against Assange. So let's not forget that. Therefore, it is possible that a successor president like Obama would do the same, but not, and this is why I asked to speak, Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden, if you go through his papers carefully, has a bad position on Assange. <laughs> I heard someone say he has a bad position on everything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, I do have to confess that I was one of those people that um, watched Julian um, inside the embassy. Um, Rob Lee used to have a live streaming, and for the last two weeks before he was taken out, I didn't sleep watching this live stream. It was very, very sad, very dreary, and it was unbelievable sad. So I was one of the people that I actually saw when the band pulled in to take him away. But my question is, uh, a lot of people on the left are really upset about Julian for coming out with the paper about Hillary before the election. I didn't vote for Hillary. I can't stand the woman. <laughs> um, but. Um, there are a lot of people on the left that are um, really, really upset that she lost, the, she lost the election. So any of you could give us any tips on how can we defend them? Because I defend myself because I didn't vote for her. But, if 
the common common issue that we run into in, in Thank the, you. on the on the left scene. Glenn, Max, do I do you want to? Yeah, either of you? Oh yeah. Well, that's a phony left. Uh, any yeah. left does not move on uh, principle because of their love for Hillary Clinton. Uh, has no principles that we can identify <laughs> with. Uh, what, what occurred, I, I, I mostly Louder. focused on... Louder. Speak, speak, uh, speak more closely to the mic. Okay. Uh, I mostly focused on uh, what was happening in, in the world uh, in terms of, of what yeah. WikiLeaks uh, was doing. Uh, in order to not get to that moment in 2016, uh, when it all became about uh, the De Democratic Party, and their loss of the election to Trump, and uh, tarring uh, Julian Assange as a Russian uh, 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 dupe, uh, which, which preceded, of course, this election, then became a Russian Trump dupe, uh, and then infects all of the discourse uh, in totally unexpected ways, uh, uh, in the midst of a real split in the ruling class. And when the ruling class gets split and its uh, various communications organisms are joined in that split, lots of absurd and ridiculous and quite confusing uh, things, things happen. Uh, some most of which a real left should not get engaged in at all. It's a labyrinth of insanity. Uh, so, so that's Can I make a few points yeah. about those? Uh, well, first of all, um, when they say, but her emails, you know, you see that on Twitter, a lot of like liberal Hillary Clinton supporters will say, but her emails as a way of dismissing the emails and their content. Well, first of all, the main tranche of emails that first appeared was not through WikiLeaks and it was not through any hack. It was by a FOIA request by a journalist, Jason Leopold, who ironically has become a big proponent of Russiagate, but he, um, or maybe not ironically. Anyway, but he FOIA'd these emails from the State Department and Hillary Clinton was foolish enough to have a private email server, um, but she also had a State Department email server and those emails had to be produced in, in the public and they contained a lot of embarrassing information that's conflated with the tranche of emails that were allegedly, well, that were obtained through a phishing scheme um, to John Podesta and password one two three yeah whose password was password one it wasn't one two three it's one um, he actually asked a DNC cybersecurity uh, uh, staffer who's in charge of cybersecurity um, you know should I respond to this um, request for my password password one which was obviously a phishing scheme and the Cybersecurity experts said, absolutely, you must absolutely respond to it. And then, you know, that poor person um, said, my mistake was not including the word not. I meant to type not, but I didn't write do not. I said, absolutely do. So, you mean, be, then beyond the kind of comedy of errors, you have the fact that everything WikiLeaks has published, um, you know, you know, contrary to what Donna Brazil or um, you know noted Russia expert Malcolm Nance says, everything is authentic and authenticated. So these were real emails, and at the time that they appeared, Hillary Clinton was running around saying that yeah, she spoke to Goldman Sachs and gave these paid talks to the squid fish that caused the housing crisis, but she didn't really say anything or make any commitments. And you know these emails exposed her. Um, deceitfulness um, and showed that she was in fact, you know, very closely, um, you know, ma making comments that were just very disturbing and making other comments that were pertinent to U.S. foreign policy. Beyond, and then you have the whole kind of Clinton influence peddling network through the Clinton Global Initiative and uh, the Clinton Foundation. These things shouldn't have existed behind a candidate and she made herself vulnerable to this. So. It's important to vet candidates and have candidates that don't have these kind of vulnerabilities or predilections. And so that's really the problem as I see it, in addition to all of the kind of um, comedic, pathetic uh, uh, attempts to you know, claim that they were just hacked by this devious, masterful operation, when in fact it was just a common phishing scheme. We have about seven minutes left in the Q&A session, so at this point, what I think would be nice is if 
I'm ha I'm, I want to try and let everybody ask a question, but I ask that you just ask a question, 10 seconds minimum, just ask the question, and then after all of you ask your question, we'll let the panelists address them as they feel their their. Be questions. sure to join us on Monday the 24th at 11 a.m. at the British Consulate for a global protest for Julian. That's at 2nd Avenue and 47th Street. There are flyers in the back by the literature table by the book table. Thank you. Okay, next question. I wanted to thank WBAI Radio for broadcasting this live this yeah, morning. Thank you, WBAI. The question for Max and for Glenn, uh, we've had a, a list of many people in jail, thrown in jail for their reporting, yet I haven't heard any mention of Umiya Abu Jamal. And to me, that's essential to link the two together. That Mamiya was a journalist, he was covering in Philadelphia, and I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you. Okay. We're just going to keep the questions coming, and then panelists take notes of what you want to address, and I'll let each of you speak for a minute. So, uh, Can anybody recommend ways to condense news articles down to sound bites for a population that does not read? And can we trust the WikiLeaks uh, Twitter feed? Right. It's a good question. I have to give a very brief beginning, which is that uh, one of the biggest impacts was the cable gate release, 250,000 State Department cables, which WikiLeaks gave to four mainstream press, which didn't do jack with it. So they turned to countries <clears throat> around the world and said, we'll give it to the local media there. One of those was Haiti Liberté, uh, the paper I work for. And we published a series in partnership with The Nation, so it could get a little visibility here, to, I'm getting to it, uh, to, um, we published a series which, when we were delivered the documents, it was a very involved process, a lot of cloak and dagger, but it was all filmed. And this was going to be made into a film which never came out. I think a book is great, but I think a film, if, if this film could come out, is there any possibility of that? Because the footage is there, I understand uh, crews were going in all the places where it was delivered in all the countries. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sir. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, just growing up in Britain, I know that the, that the British public schools uh, get religion every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that every people know is uh, deliver me not into the hands of mine enemies. And for the British part of that, uh, appealing to the British public, you know, if, if, if Julian comes here, he's screwed. Mm -hmm. But, so the, the, the major thing would be stopping him from coming here. And I know that everybody in Britain will, uh, will know that phrase. Um, do you have a... Yeah, just deliver me not into the hands of my enemies because it's so obvious biblically mm -hmm. that that, that we really, will be in the hands of his enemies here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We're really running out of time, so I just want to make sure that we have we have the opportunity for the guests to speak. I have a question for Miss Avila. Uh, since you visited Julian in prison, can you tell us in some way what is the 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 cause of of the illnesses that we hear that he's suffering from? Are they um, illnesses of depression, or does he have medical um, problems that are not being treated? If it has to do with feeling isolated and alone, please mm -hmm. convey that we are out in the streets for him. We wish there were more, but you can't trust the politicians. Corbin sat on his case in Absolutely, he did. Uh, the reason that we're st rushing on time is this is actually being broadcast, so I want to finish before the time runs out, so please, just questions. Well, I want to say thank you, and if Glenn Ford could elaborate how he warned us early about Obama, how he was a fraud, and a lot of people did not want to listen. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say that when you get activists in the room, there's a lot of disagreement. But there's one agreement here on one thing, and it's freeing um, Julian Assange. Yes. And we need more united fronts Absolutely. like this. <laughs> I'm from the Freedom Socialist Party. Thank you. Party. We have another question, I think, behind you. Hi, just a quick question. My understanding is that the yellow vests were outside of Belmarsh protesting. This is correct. Yes. Um, what we're talking about is most important is freeing Julian Assange, and he's in big trouble. And so uh, the thing is that, like the yellow vest, I think we need to organize. And I, I trust me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see on WikiLeaks or on the Courage Foundation website that the yellow vests were there. Mm -hmm. 
well, organizing for Julian Assange. I think it's, it's crucial to get that word. And, and there were prisoners as well, I believe, that organized within Belmarsh for him. So yeah. that's our questions. I want to just let each guest, or one by one, rapid fire so that we... I can start with the last one. Um, and together with the WikiLeaks, is that uh, verified that is that re reliable source of information? Yes, Courage Information and uh, Cour Courage Foundation and WikiLeaks accounts are valid and you can trust it. Important, I mean, it's a small team and it's really constrained of resources and it's dealing with a lot of things. So be patient if you don't see, be, become the voice of WikiLeaks and become the voice of Courage because it, it will be like an intense period of time. On the, con uh, on the condensed version of uh, uh, Courage Foundation and WikiLeaks, uh, the uh, Defense Committee will be producing briefs. And it will be up to you to transform those briefs. Uh, I will recommend uh, those sources uh, to, to use that as uh, the raw, raw material to transform it into podcast. I think that the, uh, it we will... Have, we just only have about one or two... Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And so it, I wanna, I, uh, yeah, sorry. Just that. Regarding the gentleman who spoke of the lack of mention of Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, that's one of the reasons that I introduced uh, the older political uh, prisoners uh, <clears throat> from from a previous era, uh, along with uh, Assange and Chelsea Manning and the rest. And we also are leading. Uh, in this week's Black Agenda report uh, with a piece that says free all political prisoners, including Assange and Manning. And uh, that is framed that way uh, because we, our core audience is a black activist audience and we want to encourage black activists who uh, uh, correctly uh, keep reminding folks of our uh, still uh, in, imprisoned prisoners uh, to, that Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning uh, should also be part of that pantheon. Uh, so it goes both ways and that's why we're trying to uh, keep uh, the political prisoners uh, in the common position that they should hold. My closing remark is an advertisement. <laughs> we haven't talked about uh, the hacking allegation against uh, Julian today. And I have a piece that came out today or yesterday or tomorrow or something like that in the Columbia Journalism Review, which tries to say that the hacking charge is a bunch of baloney. So if you want to go read that, you can. Uh, try to make three points in, two, in one minute. Uh, number one, uh, and we'll be hopefully putting up a piece today if I can get to edit it at thegrayzone.com. On the case that uh, Renata mentioned uh, yesterday on uh, Randy Credico's Live on the Fly podcast about Anna Sakoulis, the CIA spy who was entered, entered the UK uh, without the British government actually um, asking her to register as a CIA spy with their intelligence services, who killed a 19-year-old British citizen in a road accident, escaped to the US, and the US is refusing to extradite her, and the British government, like the poodle of the US that it is, is not seeking this extradition. It's a very painful, um, um, painful incident for British people, and they're seeing their government betray them and betray an innocent teenager, Harry Dunn. Um, and so we should bring this case up in the context of Assange to show uh, how extradition really works. Point number two, if Mike Bloomberg becomes the nominee, we need a yellow vest movement. Well, we need it now, but if he becomes the nominee, that's a revolutionary moment. We need yellow vests in the streets, not just on austerity, not just on plutocracy, but calling up the names of people like Eric Garland, raising issues like stop and frisk and the war on immigrants. And uh, I just wanted to, in closing, thank uh, Margaret Kunstler and Randy Credico, who brought me and Anya up here and really helped to organize this. Just 